Well, good evening, church. Trust you had a wonderful Wednesday. Terrific Tuesday, wonderful Wednesday. What do they call Thursday? I don't know. Throw, oh, throwback thing, whatever it is. Yeah. Won't you stand up with us and we'll turn our minds and hearts to our Heavenly Father tonight. Lead me to Calvary. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. This time forget thy thorn crown brow. Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Show me the tomb where thou wast led, tenderly more than web. Help me out, Kelly. Angels in robes of light array. Guardest thee whilst thou slept. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget thy agony. Lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even thy cup of grief to share, thou hast worn all for me. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, Lest I forget thy agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. That's right, we should never forget Calvary, amen, church? Hey, how about this guy up here, y'all? That's right. This guy? That's right. It's awesome. <laughs> give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Your breath and our love, so we pour out our praise, we pour out your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. You give life, you are love, you bring life to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. All the earth shall sound to praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord? All the earth will shout your praise. 
cry, these bones will sing. Great. God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you, Sam and Kim, Caleb, and Jason for getting up there and uh, playing the drums. Thank you just for reminding us how great God is. He's a good God. He's an awesome God. There's more adjectives um, than we can come up with to describe how great uh, God is. If you do need an outline, there's some in the back, some in the front. If you need any, um, if you need one, raise your hand. I think everybody may have one. If you're online with us, there's just go right down below on the Facebook page, and you can print that out too. So, so let's go, Lord, in prayer, and just ask that He might speak to us tonight. So let's pray. Dearly Father, we just bow in Your presence, and You are a great God. You're good and holy and righteous and merciful and patient with us, Lord. So, Lord, we just want you to be honored as we open up your word. May you speak. Help me to get out of your way. Lord, may you just encourage and touch hearts. And Lord, again, we're just grateful that we have your Sermon on the Mount that we can just dive into and look at tonight for a few minutes. Lord, we just ask that you would search our hearts and if there's anything in it, it's not right. Lord, may we get it right with you right now, Lord. So we have open hands and open hearts. And so, Lord, we just uh, welcome you uh, to enter this time. We just welcome your spirit. And, Lord, may you guide us through it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Like I said, we're in the Sermon on the Mount. Tonight we want to look at two choices. Some of you have binoculars maybe you've gone to a football game and you had to sit in the nosebleed section and uh, you get the binoculars and what do you do you focus them in so what's so far away brings it up into sight where you can see it and have clear focus tonight we're going to see we need to have a clear focus in, in the area in our lives and there's choices that we can make there's always two choices in everything that we can do in life. And Jesus really brings out two choices that we see tonight. So we're going to do Matthew 6 and just three verses, 22 through 24. And Jesus says here, he says, The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, <laughs> how deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, since he either will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
And so tonight we, we want to talk about this. You must choose what you want to focus your life on. You must choose what you want to focus your life on. Now last week we looked at verses 19 through 21, and we talked about how you can either be consumed by earthly treasures, or you can put your focus on eternal treasures, and we talked about how you need to hold lightly to what is temporal, and hold tightly to what is eternal, and how your heart will only follow after what you treasure. And Jesus keeps going down this thread, and he gives us two choices here tonight that we want to look into tonight. And so number one is this. You can choose spiritual blindness or spiritual sight. Spiritual blindness or spiritual sight. Jesus tells us that the eye is what? The lamp of the body. Now, he's not talking about our physical eye. He's talking about spiritually. Because almost everything in our body depends on the ability for us to see because what we see can dictate what our body does so many times. And our eyes can affect our whole body. And so let me just give you just a few truths here. Number one is this, and this is your choice. You can be filled with darkness or you can be filled with light. That's what Jesus says. He says, if your eye is healthy, it's going to be filled with light, and you will see clearly spiritually. But he says, if your eye is bad, you will not be able to see. And spiritually, a bad eye, you're going to reject whatever is in God's Word, and you're not going to have a repentant heart. Uh, and again, that I don't know, probably one of the strongest statements in that text is where he says, just think about it. So if the light within you is darkness, how deep is the darkness? That's America. It's the whole world. But I mean, that's a picture of America. They can't see the light. They can't see all this bright light we have in here now. Because they're so deep in darkness that whatever minuscule light they have, they can't even see it for all the darkness that has consumed them. But if your eye is sound spiritually, it's going to be full of light. And you'll be able to see. And how do we see? By walking with God. Jesus said, not Jesus. John said in 1 John 1, 7, he says, If we walk in the light, as he himself is the light, Jesus is the light. We have what? Fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. See, when you're walking in the light, and you just say, man, I'm going to walk in the light of Christ, and in the way you and I as Chryslers walk in the light, you know, I mean, we spend, get in the light of God's Word, and then what happens? The Holy Spirit will illuminate it, And then he'll show you what is real, and he'll show you what is fake. And there's a lot of fake today. (laughs) There's a lot of fake in the evangelical world today. (laughs) And many people are buying into it because um, they're allowing too much darkness into their sight. What did we talk about? What's the main... One of those main statements are brought out Sunday. I'll bring it out every week. Every Christ follower is a disciple. But not every Christ follower is living a life of a disciple. Because sometimes Christ followers can allow things in the world to muddy their thinking and their seeing. And when you allow some darkness into that light, things start to get what? little blurry and you can't determine where the clear clear lines are because you're not walking where you need to be in the light and when we try to walk too closely with the world things get really blurry and you will not see light you won't be bright and dark it'll be kind of gray and you won't be able to tell what's what 
Second, you can choose to be spiritually healthy or spiritually unhealthy. Jesus is talking about spiritual blindness here. He's not talking about physical blindness. But he says, man, if your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Now, that phrase he uses there is actually a Hebrew expression that they would use back then. And it would always refer to stinginess or greed. They would say a stingy person or a greedy person has a bad eye. That's how the Hebrews, the Jews, and Jesus uses this statement knowing that many of the people he's speaking to are coming from a Jewish background or would have been very familiar with that. And so he's saying, man, if you're unhealthy, you're going to be double-minded, you're not going to see well, and you're going to have a bad eye. Proverbs 28, 22 says, A greedy one is in hurry for wealth, and he does not know that poverty will come to him. See, so many people are chasing things that are unhealthy. And when things were not healthy, things get distorted. And when things get distorted, we make wrong decisions. And so Jesus said, man, you need to choose. Are you going to choose God? Are you going to choose His wisdom so that you can be spiritually healthy? Or are you just going to try to mix in with the world? And if you do, you'll get a bad eye. <laughs> And you won't see things clearly. Which leads us to number three. This is the third. You can choose. You'll be a generous person if you see clearly. And a stingy person will be spiritually blind. And this is what Jesus is hammering here. He's saying, if you're generous, you're going to have a good eye. And you're going to be generous. And however God leads you to be generous. The Jewish leaders back then, they would say a charitable person has a good eye, just like a stingy person has a bad eye. See, when you walk with Jesus, trust Jesus, you'll see clearly and you'll give what Jesus tells you to give. And that's why he ties this in with earthly treasures. Because if you're, if you're holding only tightly to what you have, you're, you're not going to have a good eye. You're going to have a bad eye. And you're going to be spiritually blind. Let me just, I'll just hit this here. This, this is, you'll get this truth, but you need to understand this truth. Because I think everybody in the house gets this truth and don't lie. Don't know, can't remember what the statistics are. But probably the average church member gives like about 3% or less to a church. The number of those in the church that will give a tithe will be a small percentage. Just telling you. 25% would be very good in an American church today. 25% of its members tight. Now, if you take what Jesus is teaching here, okay, and you apply that, that means many in our pews are not walking in the will of God. They're walking according to bad vision. And bad vision will cause you to make bad decisions, which will lead you to get into sin. And the devil have his way with your life and your family. And when you have many in a pew walking in to a church with bad vision and bad eyes, they're not going to be seeking God, and they're really not going to be seeking the will of God, and some don't really expect God to move in the church. And when you add several years of that on top of one after another, after another, after another, no wonder we don't see anything happening in the house of God. That's why God says, where where's judgment start? His house. Because too many of His people 
their vision has gotten blurry and the world has affected their vision instead of God affecting their vision and they seeing things from God's perspective. And so don't think I'm asking for money because I'm not. Because God wants your obedience. God owns it all anyway. Plus, this is a Wednesday night crowd. This just happens to be the next text. You know what I'm saying? It's the next text. But we need to pray that people would see clearly and do what God, what God wants them to do with whatever he gives them because when they do, God's going to bless He's just going to bless. But money and stuff will corrupt us. We all know that. But our single eye needs to be set on God. He says, man, you've got a good eye or you can have a bad eye. A good eye, I've got to focus on, all right, what does God want me to do? God's given me this. What do I do with it? How does He want me to give? How does He want me to serve with it? Instead, I'll promise you, most people in the church, it's like, okay, this is mine, 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 this is mine. Okay, God, you get that. Now, that's not as... That's probably true. Not as much now, you know why? I'm just slinging it tonight. Uh, because they don't, they're nowhere near the house of God anymore. Because COVID just wiped them out the door. Because their eye was not where it needed to be. So you can choose spiritual blindness. Don't do that. Or you can choose spiritual sight. And God will give you wisdom and direction in whatever He gives you. Number two, you cannot serve two masters. Now we've all heard this, we've been in church a little bit. Nobody can serve two masters. Now, I think Jesus may have been thinking also of a slave here. You say, why do you say that? Because a servant can work for more than one boss, right? A servant would be like an employee today. Can you work for more than one boss? Can you have more than one job? Yeah, you can. But a slave, one master, that's it. One owner. Slave, did they have any rights? Was their time theirs? Nope. True Christ followers, we have one master, Jesus. Do you have any rights? Well, the Constitution says I have rights. But as a Christ follower, you have none because you belong to Christ. So let me give you a couple truths here that Jesus brings out. You'll either be devoted to God or money and materialism. That's what he's saying. Now you can divide life really into spiritual and material or secular, whichever, if you want to keep it in the S's, it's spiritual and secular. And you'll be devoted to one or the other. Now that word here, devoted here in this text, means to cling to, to be loyal to. Which means there's no riding of the fence. Now some texts will use the word mammon. King James would use the word mammon. The Greek word there is referring to money, wealth, and possessions. I think that pretty much covers it, right? It covers everything that you might have. So you be devoted to God or stuff. You can't ride the fence. Can anybody mount two horses at one time? No, you can really only ride one. There might be some trick artist, but you know, you know what I'm saying. You can only mount one horse at a time. You can only be devoted to God, and if you're not devoted to God, you'll be devoted to money and stuff. 
text says you'll honor one <laughs> and offend one. Again, man, we, we want to make, come on, we want to make some middle ground here so we can play on both sides of the fence. But you can't. James 4, 4 said this, he says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world, he said, is hostility toward God. So whoever wants to be the friend of the world, don't miss this, becomes the enemy of God. So if you're not devoted to God, <laughs> James is pretty blunt. You're either a friend of God or what? You're an enemy. You're like, well, I'm a good person. I might be a good moral person. But if money, materialism, and stuff is what you're devoted to, you're not a friend of God. You're an enemy. Because money's been your master. See, material possessions, man... In this world that we live in, now it may change some now that we're in high inflation. People might <laughs> think, twi <coughs> think twice about getting so um, wrapped up in stuff. But still, stuff can draw us in so fast. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and you not even trying to be drawn into it. You know what I'm saying? Because the culture we live, man, it'd be nice. You know, there's just so much. Well, that's, is, does God mind you having stuff? Let me just go ahead and kick that out. No, he doesn't mind you having stuff. It's just, does the stuff have you? That's the, you know, that's, oh, God doesn't mind you having stuff. How do you use the stuff? Or does the stuff have you? This is what he's saying. And then second, money and materialism can push God away from your life. And I think this is really the problem in America, especially the American church. I mean, people dropped out of church just because money and materialism became their God and it pushed them out of church and to push God out of their life. You may know this. If you don't know this, you'll get it now. There's about 1,000 verses on faith and prayer. 1,000. 500, roughly about 500 on faith, about 500 on prayer. Jesus talks about money and possessions in 2,300 verses. He talked about that twice than faith and prayer. Why? Because he knows how much that can pull you away from Christ and become an idol. And it will distract us from the things of God. And he knows you can become possessed by your possessions in a heartbeat. So that's why I think he, he hammers it so much. 2,300 verses. Jesus talks about something a couple of times. It's pretty important. 2,300 times, he's like, wow. I think he's trying to tell us something. So let me give you some application, very uh, few points here, and then we'll dive off into some prayer requests. Um, application, God and money both can both grip your heart. I mean, God wants to grip your heart and, and, and draw you closer and work in your life. But money and materialism can grip and enslave your heart and greed can become a powerful idol just like that. What was the problem with the rich young ruler? <laughs> Things, money, gripped his heart. God... Jesus said, man, I want you to follow me. Give it up. Man, let me grip your heart. He said, no, nah, I can't do that. 
So Jesus is comparing money and owning property to being just like, hey, you can be devoted to me and my kingdom or you can be devoted to this. Number two, God and money both demand to be served. Another choice. You can serve God or you serve money. See, God is a jealous God. He wants all of us. He not want part of us. He wants all of us. And whatever he gives you, you yeah, thank God, whatever he's given you. Because I think whatever he's given you, Scripture, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, comes from down from God. Whatever you have, God's blessed you. It's just how do you hold it? Do you serve God with it or do you serve money? And then number three, God demands your allegiance. He wants your allegiance. Like I said, slave owned by the master. You cannot give allegiance to two lords. <laughs> it's either give it to God or give it to stuff. John Wesley said this, <laughs> the last part of a person to be saved is his wallet. God dem and that's powerful. God demands our allegiance because I think that's why Jesus spoke on it so much because he knew it could draw us away from him. And he's saying, hey, understand. Give it to me. Give me your allegiance. I'll help you through it. And so number four, you can be a slave, as I said, to only one owner at a time. You'll be a slave to Jesus, or you'll be a slave to your stuff. You cannot be for something and against something. You cannot serve the two masters. Have we all tried to do that in time as our lives? Probably, yeah. <laughs> but you can't. God says, what? Give me your heart. What does money say? Now keep all you can. What does God say? He said, be content with what you have. What does money say? Get all you can. Do all you can. Remember the story of Jesus, and you know, the guy saying, you know, man, we're, we're just going to, we're rich, we're just going to have a party, have fun. Well, you're not promised tomorrow. So you've got to make a choice. You're going to do it God's way, be generous, tithe and give God. Or are you going to cheat God? Money in the world says just cheat God. So you choose your focus. Every day you'll choose your focus. Is it going to be on God today? Or is it going to be on stuff? And When it's stuff, it means self. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, said this, There was a man, some called him mad. The more he gave, the more he had. See, the world and the flesh and the devil tell you, you cannot give, you cannot be faithful to give to God, he, you'll run out of money. But the thing is, you'll never outgive God. And if you put your focus, choose to focus your life on Him, all those Issues over here, as far as money and treasures and all that, <laughs> we'll see in verse 33, if you'll seek him, it'll all take care of itself. 
but you've got to make a choice. God or money. And that's a choice people have. And the reason many people don't want to give their lives to Christ is it may not be money, but that money leads to self, and it's all about self. And so we've got to understand the way we live, we can have a good eye or we can have a bad eye. We can be spiritually healthy, spiritually unhealthy. We can have clear eyes or it can be all muddied. And so just encourage you with that. Um, focus on him. Make sure your focus is always on him. Let me give you some prayer requests and then we're going to uh, pray. Uh, they're on your sheet there. They may probably be on the back of your sheet. Um, but let's just pray for an end of the war in Ukraine. Man, just pray for an end to all this evil and violence and ungodly atrocities. Um, you know, pray for the families that have lost loved ones. Pray for these wives and children. Many of them are separated from their husbands. Um, pray for the man, protection of the children, man, from just the outright evil that's going on. So keep in prayer for them. Like I said, pray for Dan and Laurie Upchurch. Uh, they're missionaries. Um, now they're in Poland, but they were missionaries 22 years in Ukraine, and they're trying to help the church planners. They're trying to help the refugees. They're trying to start church churches on uh, the Poland border for all those Ukrainians. So just really uh, pray for them. Uh, then pray for the search committee uh, as they search for the man of God to be the associate pastor of children of students. Uh, they're hard at work, so pray for them. Uh, then praise the Lord, uh, like I said, uh, for all those uh, who served yesterday, prayed. Uh, we were able to deliver 200 carnations to administrative assistants, kind of all over the city uh, and county. And we were able to talk to several, uh, pray that some of those that we talked to might surrender their life to Christ or maybe come to church Sunday. We, we did have several... Uh, good visits, um, and like I said, reason to call it shock and all, uh, just tell you, um, I'm a white man, yeah, I'm walking in with Janice, we're walking in the building, schools, different places, police departments, anywhere, flowers in our hands. A lot of people's first thoughts are, what in the world are these people selling us? And then you tell them we're here just to say thanks for serving and, you know, just wanted to encourage you. And you, be, you can just see their de demeanor change before your eyes. Like, within seconds, they're like, oh, wow, thank you so much. And then that leads to conversation. Oh, wow, where are y'all at? You know, oh, man, I need to go to church or I need to get back. You know, so it's just uh, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for giving your gifts. <laughs> your tithes and offers help pay for that um, and to where we could go and minister to people really all around the um, the county. I mean, we went everywhere. Um, I, think, I think the only school we didn't hit was Southwest out in Rents. So I just didn't have anybody <laughs> going that way. But we hit every other school. We hit fire department. We hit every, you know, we hit a lot of police and you know, doctor's offices, government offices. So we hit a lot of people. Uh, so again, just thank you uh, for your prayers on that. Number five, pray for many Muslims all over the world. If you don't realize they're celebrating Ramadan, and it's where they fast from uh, uh, basically sun up to sundown. And then they'll pig out, and when the sun comes up, then, you know. But many of them work in heart parts of the country the heart parts of the world and they're doing this 30-day fasting pray for them that hey that they might be confronted with the gospel many muslims are coming to know the world you may not realize they come to know the lord through dreams about jesus and in their most of their language uh, Jesus' name would be Isa, I-S-A. And many times they've had dreams about Jesus, and many times many of them give their lives to Jesus. Or they're confronted with it in 
with the hopes of maybe they might come to know the true and living God. So now is a critical time. I mean, they're they're through this through the this is the last week, and so they'll wrap up at the end of the month. So pray that many might come to know Christ. Then pray for our children and students to be protected uh, from the schemes of Satan. And then, uh, like I said, pray for the Southern Baptist Convention. They'll be coming up and just pray. Convention will take steps to go back to conservative beliefs and that the direction of the convention can be changed. Okay? So we're going to pray. Like I said, you can break up into groups of two, three, four, whatever y'all want to do. Um, if you have requests, let uh, your group know. Um, you don't have to pray out loud. Um, you just pray as God leads you. If it's silently, that's fine. doesn't matter. Uh, if you're online, again, y'all pray for those two. And uh, Sunday we'll be looking at two more characteristics of the life of a disciple. So, uh, so let's uh, we'll wrap it up online, and uh, we'll get ready to get about praying. Okay.